<laughs> um, boar on apple is a beetle. So in, in the western part of the country, they have flat-headed boar, which usually goes to damaged tissue, usually from sunburn. Um, here in the east, the beetle is the round-headed apple tree boar. And this is a, a striped beetle. It's, it's orangish, yellowish kind of stripes. I've only seen it in its adult form twice, but I have seen its grubs, which is the part that concerns me, hundreds of times. And, you know, I have a, a bachelor's degree in civil engineering, but my PhD is in boar. And I got it by not, not going to any particular university, but in the course of losing 50, 60 trees over the course of, of my time. So I have deep psychological obsessions with this insect. <laughs> and why I have boar karma and somebody else doesn't, I don't know. I, I don't know the past life bit of this. But it is true that on some sites you could have incredible pressure and be losing trees and other sites they don't even know the notion of something that eats the inner bark of the tree. And so borer is something that it's on apple, it's also on white ash, it's on something called the, uh, the mountain maple which is a kind of a shrubby maple that doesn't really get to be like tree stature but has a white reddish kind of uh, light gray reddish kind of bark and whenever you you cut down a tree and you see these tunnels in the base of, the, of the, the, the stem of the wood, that's an indication that you have borers. So there's, there's many different species of borers. The point here is that with apple, we're talking about a beetle. Uh, if we're talking about peach borer, and there's a couple types, that's a moth. And so the fact that one's a beetle, one's a moth, that, that changes some of the dynamics of how we think about it. But what they both do is somewhat the same, and that is lay eggs in the bark, um, so that a little grub hatches, and that's the actual true borer. And in the case of this beetle, those eggs are going to be laid somewhere in June, July, and August um, by an adult who has emerged from a tree where it has just spent the last two years as a grub eating the inner cambium cells. So that egg laid in the, the height of summer hatches, and going into harvest, that little grub may only get to be about an eighth three sixteenths of an inch big and at most will have eaten like the area that the size of a dime on a young tree but it's going to be in there for two years and it's going to it might go up but usually it goes down a couple inches and chews the bark off of a root and then comes over this way and does another dime and maybe now it's a quarter size and in two years one grub alone can kill a little tree wow. there's no longer a connection but from the outside you can be aware of it, but unless you know what to look for, you may not be aware of it. And then that little tree just blows over and, and you think you didn't do anything wrong, but all along this was taking place. And when that beetle emerges to go find trees to lay its eggs, it's in flight and it crawls down the trunk. So it's, it's, it smells the apple, it smells the right kind of tree. And it crawls down that trunk and it wants to go to the soil line ideally. And it can lay as many as seven eggs in one tree. And now I'm not talking so much the thumb size diameter, but more like a young tree <coughs> like this. And <coughs> all seven may not hatch, but there could be two, three, or four that do. And, and so you, you can lose mid-sized trees as well. Once the tree gets really big, there's a point where it's more likely to survive. So this is something that is going to be in there for two years. And what we've typically had as a means of dealing with that is, you know, I have this habit of doing a number of things for my trunks. And one is pulling weeds or, or things right against the base because I want to keep it more open. But when I come in here, I'm also looking for things like orange frass. So th this is really old and aged, but the frass will be brighter orange when it's fresh. That's that's just their, their waste. You know, they eat the bark and the poop comes out the other end and it's usually pushed out of their emergence hole. And with young trees, another thing you'll see is kind of like a, a slight depression in the bark and it might, it often is a little bit darker, but I'm looking for that. So if I see borer, I have my pocket knife with me. And when that damage has occurred, um, in this case, on this tree, there was a spot 
here higher up and you can see some of that frass. And similarly, you'll see frass in here and, and even a woodpecker. Well, you said woodpecker, but I don't think so. You don't think so? I have another suspicion. Oh, there you go. And I see some frass on this side that looks a little bit fresher as well. It's a little further up. And here you see kind of like a whole kind of frassy vein. But when I come in with my knife, I'm, I think they have a knife. I don't cut a knife. I'm aware that the cambium has been eaten in that zone, and I'm really not going to make it work worse. Um, I guess also as a disclaimer, I should say that I'm a dentist's son, so I'm really into cleaning out the cambium. <laughs> so these are old looking trash, but like here, even now, I've kind of revealed that ant has nothing to do with this, but I've revealed a little bit more orange. So as I start to, well now the ants are, the ants have nothing to do with this. <laughs> I'm pissing them off. But the borer, now it's looking a little fresher. The borer has gone sideways here. And I'm just cutting a little bit of the fresh bark. We're probably even going to get a live one. This is all just for the demonstration, folks. We've planned this for weeks. <laughs> Two years ago, right? <laughs> Two years ago we planned this. But I totally like to dig it out the whole area because I'm looking, I want to make sure I don't leave it. Now we're going to get a little bit better and try to prevent them from even coming and we'll talk about how I do that. Sometimes you actually need like a wire and it's kind of like fishing Oops. and you, you poke the wire deeper into the hole. The first time I saw somebody do this was at the common ground fair on one of their trees there was that guy jack hurt, hurt yep. thing, and he just went crazy it was like he he saw it the frass or whatnot and he just was like possessed he whipped out his <laughs> knife he scared the living crap out of everybody in the hole you know he it was uh yeah so i'm hoping i've either crushed it because i'm reaching solids feeling wood now or maybe it's completed its cycle and in completing its cycle, you do, you look for that little bit of goo in the tip of your knife and you know that that would be marked success. But, I, but I've scratched up the bark here, but I haven't hurt the tree. That'll callus over. The damage is really already done. And in cutting a little bit deeper, I might spend the rest of the afternoon just doing this. <laughs> Michael, here's a piece of wire if you want. I haven't really found a hole per se. Oh, okay. I've, I've pretty much excavated it, but I, I worked my way all along those edges because it could nosedive any kind of direction. How big is that? Well, it's going to be anywhere from when that egg slit is first made, and you can actually see the egg slits on tender bark, to being really tiny, you won't really see it, to getting to be about as big as maybe up to an inch if it's been in there for two years. And what it does once it's matured that fall or early in the next spring, I'm not sure of the timing of this, it starts to bore a hole up the trunk and it'll go through the solid wood and it'll go up six inches to, to as much as two foot six inches. And there will be a quarter inch hole where it emerges as a beetle that next summer to go find another fruit tree and do its damage. So like this amount of damage on a tree this big is not an issue, but if, if we really got into it, and we started to look for further damage. Um, in this case, there's been some activity higher up. And again, every time there's ants in these holes, which is, is a new thing. But even with older looking holes, if I'm here probing, I just probe it so I know there's no like side tunnel. But this is definitely an adult emergence hole. So that grub got to spend two years, whether it was this one, um, went down a root and then worked its way up through the hole. If we were to cut this tree, I see a few emergence holes. One, two, and there was another one somewhere over There's here. A big one on the right there. Um, I'd probably find two, three holes in the wood of this tree. But we don't have to go to that step. So what do you do? It's like a nice pillow here. Oh, I see. <laughs> so one approach um, that I tried early on was the notion of taking window screen and wrapping it because the borer has to be able to get to that bark. 
And what happened there was, unless you're really careful down below, it might crawl in under. It does work its way from the top, but it can go down to the soil. Or it often will just lay eggs at the top of the screen. Can't get to the soil line, it lays up there. That's a little better because that's more likely to be found by birds. It wants to get to the soil line because the birds are less likely to find it there. But that's a lot of work. And once you've developed this paranoia, you want to check underneath the screen. On top of that, occasionally you actually get a tree from the nursery already equipped with a borer, which is, <laughs> which is always a shock. So then we got into the notion that, okay, let's do a, a slurry of clay and maybe even mix, and here I was using the kale and clay, but not the, the spray product, but this pottery grade clay. And even mix some sheetrock compound or plaster of Paris, not to make like a total cast, but to create a white place where I'd really see that grass, and it does tend to deter them. But it also needed to be done like in the month of June, the month of July, and even renewed in August to be fully effective, and that, that was a lot of time, so that wasn't really happy. So then, in the course of time, I started using neem oil, so I'll do this a little bit now. Neem oil comes from a tree that grows in India and Northern Africa, Southwest Asia. It can grow here in Florida, Southern California. So it's a tropical tree. We're probably 10 years away from being able to grow it up there because of climate change. And in India, it has been used as a medicine for thousands of years, an Ayurvedic medicine for people and also an Ayurvedic agriculture. And when I use it in my holistic spray mix, We'll get, I'll get into explaining the terpenoid content and inducing systemic resistance and, and also the fatty acids, the fats that are a part of this are there. But another thing neem contains are um, seven or eight different azadiractin constituents. So azadiractins have an impact on insects in the molting cycle. So insects all have to go from egg to larva to pupa to adult. And even in the larva stage, that's not just one stage, but it's usually several instar stages of development. And to do that molting, an insect um, produces a hormone coat called ectozyme. And azadiractin inhibits the production of that ectozyme hormone. And so an insect is not killed outright by neem, but if it's a juvenile in the different molting phases, it gets locked into the phase that it's in. And I like to explain things that are important by using analogies. So here's my analogy for how neem works on an insect. When we were each 12, 13 years old, we listened to a certain kind of music. And for a brief time, that was okay. We could survive that onslaught of whatever that was. Whether that was Alice Cooper or today it might be Britney Spears. Justin Bieber, uh, Lady Gaga. Let's, let's focus on Lady Gaga. And so if at 12 or 13 years old someone came and sprayed you with neem and you were no longer able to change the music on the iPod, which you naturally were going to progress and get to listening to the Grateful Dead and Ella Fitzgerald and, and Bob Dylan and all sorts of good stuff. Um, but if you were locked in and listening to Lady Gaga hour after hour, night after day, you would eventually just succumb and say, it's just not worth continuing. <laughs> and so this is how neem works on an insect. So what I have taken to doing is doing botanical trunk sprays of neem at a 1% to 2% concentration. And these sprays are made specifically in mid-June and mid-July. And if it's a really infested site, I might also do it in mid-August as well. And what I do is I spray from the first branches down. So this higher neem concentration would burn foliage. I'm not spraying it in the tree. I know that the beetle in the month of June, July, and into August is landing in the tree and crawling down. So even though the beetle is an adult and it's not going to be impacted by the neem oil, it senses it. So neem oil acts as a feeding deterrent for things like Japanese beetle. It also acts as an egg-laying deterrent for some of these species because they just sense this thing, this Lady gaga realization effect that's coming. And so I'm spraying this fatty acid thing that soaks into the bark, but I deliberately take time to actually puddle it up at the base of the tree. And puddling it up means I see the runoff 
and it's like half an inch deep. I see a, literally a puddle around the base of the tree that quickly soaks in. But that concentration is now going to be absorbed by the bark, and these grubs are found at the soil line. So my timing is such that I'm having an impact on the adult that's coming to lay the egg for the next round, but I'm also having an impact on any grub that's in there and in locking it in its molting cycle so it doesn't come and emerge as a beetle the next time. And over the course of a few years, this has totally replaced the idea of the window screen and the play. I still check my trunks. You know, I, there may be one that succeeds, um, <coughs> and I'll see that damage. But for the most part, I don't even see the egg scars anymore. And it, it did take me a lot of lost trees where I can go into a tree and, like you just said about jacket moth guts, you just, you know it's happening and you got to do something about it. But for the, when you're starting out, even though you've just heard me say all this, you'll go look at your trees unless you see that bright orange frass. I may see other signs that you want. And once you understand, there could be as many as seven eggs. It's like mm. you'll, you'll just start sleeping outside by your trees <laughs> <laughs> as, as you work to defend them. But that's been really phenomenal. Now, if you're dealing with the peach tree borer, this is something where these clear-winged moths, uh, the peach tree borer itself does the soil line, but the lesser peach tree borer does the crotches of branches. So is anyone growing peaches and dealing with this here? I'm not, I'm growing peaches. I had, I don't know if, you, if this is what you're talking about, but last fall I found orange gelatin at the base of my tree. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a species that's laying 20, 30, 40 eggs. And so the numbers, it's not about being in there two years, it's about an incredible number of grubs in that. So the botanical trunk spray with neem has a lot of value to repel that and impact those grubs somewhat. But sometimes the situation is so out of hand and if you let two and three years go by and didn't do anything about boar, you probably will lose your peach tree. You know, if you're <laughs> talking gelatinous, it's pretty yeah. thick. Um, Almost a teaspoon of it. One of the things you can then do, and this is, this is again, it's about what do I have in my organic toolbox? So right now I'm talking about a specific insect I know where it is, I know what it's doing, I know its cycle, its timing. So if I really see huge numbers, neem doesn't kill the grubs. It locks them. It's going to take 9 to 12 days before they, they succumb. So this is just too much of the Lady Gaga thing. On the other hand, given that level of infestation, another thing we can utilize are thing, uh, the species called parasitic nematodes. So there are nematodes that eat insect larva and pupa in the soil. And they're, they're naturally found in many soils, but not concentrated enough to necessarily knock back a situation. And there are different nematodes that work different depths. So depending on what we're talking about in the soil, you would choose a specific nematode. And I don't remember the botanical Latin name for this one. I think it's Steinmara capsica, but I, that has to be looked up. One of the things you can do in this situation where those peach tree borers are going up several inches, mostly at the soil line, but they go up a little bit, is buy the beneficial packet of nematodes and make a mud pack. So now you're not applying, normally we just sprinkle them into the soil on a rainy day and they're, they're washed into the soil, but here we want to maintain it up high. And if you were dealing with a lesser apple tree peach borer, they actually go into the crotches of the lower branches, the favorite crotches. Make a mud pack, a mud slurry that you put the nematode mixture into mm -hmm. and apply that. So that gives them a soil type environment to have a few days in order to find those grubs that are in the bark of the, the tree. I don't do that so much for round-headed apple tree borer, but if you had a huge infestation, that is what you would look at needing to do to clean that up. And then you can go on from there, knowing that they're moths. Um, there's different ways to work with moths, and there, there are, we're not so much getting into the insects yet, but one of the things we identified is the scent of the female, the pheromone scent that attracts the male. And they're just starting to find the scents that attract the female. So you can put pheromone traps up to start to capture the moths before they lay their eggs. Mm -hmm. But sometimes you have to clean up the situation because the numbers are so against you. And so yeah. that's the kind yeah, of... Yeah, I did dig away at the base and I got as much of the gelatin out and hosed it off and cleaned it up as best I could. Right, but that's the frass versus right. the beast. Right. And it's the beast that you need to get. Michael, the application for 
you said it, uh, the bore is July, June, July, and August. Do we just do the one application of the neem oil in June, or do we repeat it? So, I try to do it. I have a site where it's really severe pressure. You know, my my first hundred trees, when I figured out what borer was, I would write down results, and I would find them like in 98 of 100 trees. So it was severe pressure. And so in such sites, in the cleanup phase, I'd be doing it three times. I typically do it now every year twice, because that's just where I'm at. Um, this in mid June, mid July. This is all about when's the time that the beetle crawls down to lay eggs. So I'm I'm trying to both impact the grubs and I'm also working to repel that beetle from laying its eggs. But I say that, but I also <coughs> am going to tell you that my first holistic spray is half directed on the ground and the lower trunk. So I'm I'm doing some early spring there's neem in that mixture as well. Not as high of a concentration, but it's... Mm -hmm. So I'm having some broader reach in that respect. So we did that, 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 you know, more diluted neem spray. When we do that, should we also spray the soil around the tree then? I am by virtue of splatter. I'm not so much spraying the soil, but I'm spraying it to such an extent that the runoff the puddles up. I mean, I see a puddle at the base of a tree when right. I do this. Do you try to do that in a period that's going to be dry for a few days, or does it not matter? No. Okay. It's fats, and that's going to be oily. It sticks mm. to the bark. It's going to be absorbed by the bark. Yeah. One to two percent is what, what I'm doing. What do you mix it with? For the trunk. For the trunk, yeah. Well, that means if I had 100 gallons of spray, it's one gallon of neem. That's one percent. It's water. It's, water. it's going water. with water. And you said something about soap to improve mm. uh, bonding. bonding. Okay, so. we'll, we'll continue with me. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important. No, it's, it, it's good. It's good. <laughs> so neem, because of all these fats, which have all these virtues, um, at 60 degrees, it's like butter. And so, you, one, you have to thaw neem to work with it. By thaw, I just mean it has to be at a warmer temperature so it, it goes into the liquid phase. And any kind of fat or oil, if you dump it, olive oil, into water, it doesn't mix. Mm -hmm. So you need to emulsify it. And that's where some type of soap comes into play. So in your handout, it has a, a home orchardist rate for a backpack sprayer. And it gives a rate, I don't remember the number, but... Let me see. <laughs> it gives a rate of mixing 2.5 ounces of pure neem oil with a teaspoon of soap to achieve a 0.5% neem concentration. Now, that 0.5% that is so that I don't cause phytotoxic mm -hmm. burn. And it isn't because it's neem oil, it's because it's an oil. Any okay. kind of oil fats at a high concentration on foliage would would do that, particularly as the temperature is higher. So when I mix my 100 gallon spray tanks worth, that half gallon of neem I'm using to get 0.5% concentration requires a quarter cup of soap. It's not a lot of soap. And the soap I'm using is usually something like either Ecova or seventh generation natural dishwashing liquid. Now that's a, a, a soap that I can, I know its concentration. So some people use Dr. Bonner's or the Castile soap they're a weaker soap, and they might require that you use a higher rate of that. I was saving the neem thing because I have neem in my trunk, and we were going to mix up some neem. I was going to show you all this and what it's supposed to look like. That's okay. We can do that. But that mixing of soap into the neem is important, and that's soap poured into the neem, and it goes from a yellow, a greenish yellow coloration to a more milky yellow coloration. And then that, in turn, is poured into a bucket of warm water. So you don't have to have your whole sprayer filled with warm water, but for the initial part of the mixing, a bucket of warm water is useful. And the soap-neem mixture...